No children have ever gone to space. Though more than 900,000 kids were lucky enough to go to space camp, that did not include myself. But let's imagine there was some future first kid going to space. We'll call her Cassie. Cassie Opia. And she's on her way to join her parents on the moon's first space city. Child astronaut Cassie would likely experience intense public and media scrutiny. Before launch, she might guest on morning talk shows, get slimed at the Kids' Choice Awards, and maybe even collaborate with a popular space-themed YouTube series. Like any child actor, this public scrutiny could affect her mental health and personal development. Cassie would also face intense physical and psychological pressures from the rigors of space travel to the isolation and confinement of being in a spacecraft. Leaving all of her friends behind on Earth would be pretty tricky for a kid, and she'd only be able to talk to them from space via satellite. Basically, there are some pretty valid reasons why kids today go to space camp and not to space. Governments here on Earth have a lot of regulations to protect the welfare of minors, and there would likely be a long approval process with consideration for Cassie's developmental well-being. All of these issues are things that we have to consider, not just with future child astronauts, but with kids here on Earth today. In this episode, we'll explore the unique challenges and current strategies for designing for children, and how we can apply those to the space industry. Hello, I'm Eric Stribling, and this is Space for Children. The hypothetical example of Cassie brings up several issues intrinsic to the design of technologies intended for children. First, children are in the process of development, physically, emotionally, and psychologically, and their needs change based on their age. Play is one of the biggest ways that young children learn as they grow, so goods and technologies need to be designed appropriately. Much like adults, children often use products like toys and games in ways that are not intended by the designers. Items designed for children have to be able to withstand a lot, from daily snuggles to sticky hands and maybe even getting chewed on. Although I might do that too. Kids' toys need to be durable, have lots of safety features, and also be simple enough for children to use intuitively. And that's a lot harder than it used to be. Because children don't just play with blocks and stuffed toys anymore, they also have access to technologies like the internet and social media. Where actually I think they still play with blocks. I mean, that's kind of what Roblox is, right? Second, children have parents. And parents are important. They are primarily responsible for their children's safety, and that includes their privacy too. Children don't always understand what they're getting themselves into, and there are legal limitations on their ability to give consent, which is why parents have to sign so many forms, whether they're going to space or just space camp. And this is even more important when we think about children's privacy on the internet. You might not realize it, but when you use your smartphone to upload your latest brunch pic, you're actually relying on the power of satellite communications. It's thanks to space that social media is so interwoven in our lives. Is that why they call it MySpace? Social media is not designed for children. But here's the thing. Children still use it. Following the guidelines of the U.S. Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, platforms from Instagram to TikTok to Snapchat mandate that users be at least 13 years old, 
But according to a 2022 study, 68% of preteens report using social media apps. And that's cause for concern, because adolescence is a crucial time for brain development, including important things like emotional regulation and impulse control. Social media platforms are addictive, and adolescent brains are less capable of resisting the temptation. In practice, that means less time for sleep, exercise, and being out in nature. Researchers also point to social media as a cause of increasing mental health issues among adolescents, and we haven't even mentioned cyberbullying, unsuitable content, and the physical effects of screen time. Have you ever heard of Technic? It's no wonder people worry. But remember, technologies like social media are tools, and these tools can be designed to maximize benefits and minimize harms. To learn more about designing products for children, we spoke with an expert who has a lifetime of first-hand experience in toy testing and imaginative play. Thanks, Sienna! We also spoke with Dr. Sabina Lowe, an associate professor in Arizona State University's Sanford School of Social and Family Dynamics, about her research on how technologies can be designed to benefit children and support their positive development. Digital technology has become an essential part of our daily lives, and that happened pretty fast. It wasn't long ago that we were unfolding giant paper maps for directions or writing lessons on chalkboards. So it's no surprise that people worry about the effects of this rapid change, especially on children. And especially since our knowledge of how this impacts children has lagged relative to the rate of technological changes. Have you heard the term neuroplasticity? Neuroplasticity refers to the brain's adaptability or how much it changes and grows in response to new experiences and knowledge. Think of the brain like a lump of clay being shaped into a pot or a vase or bowl before it goes into the kiln. We used to think of children's brains as that malleable, squishy clay and adult brains as the hardened pot fresh from the oven. But We've learned that neuroplasticity is important for adult brains too. When we talk about technology, it's important to consider how all of our brains are potentially being shaped by repeated use. For example, authors like Nicholas Carr have written about how much harder it is to focus on deep reading when you're used to skimming bite-sized information online. Think about it. How often do you pick up your phone to check Instagram or scroll through TikTok or scroll through one more video on Facebook. But neuroplasticity is especially important for children as their brains are going through an incredible period of growth. Children's brains are more plastic, more like the metaphorical lump of clay or Play-Doh, meaning that they're more susceptible to environment and social influences or influencers. But here's the good news. Technology is a tool and it can be used in a lot of constructive ways. It's not inherently good or bad. I use technology to optimize small group instruction in the classroom. And when I walk into schools, they often say, no, that's the last thing we need or want is more technology. But technology can play a really supportive role in child development. Here's just one example. Peer support is vital to school success. Think of relationships as a bridge between educational instruction and learning, because learning is a fundamentally social process, and that's where technology can come in. In our research, we used an internet-based tool called Peer Learning to help students learn together in small groups, basically to help guide small group learning. Just recently, my colleague and I conducted an experiment in 12 middle and high schools in the Pacific Northwest to test the impacts on social and academic outcomes. And what we found was really exciting. Students who use the peer learning system had significant positive impacts on their development of social emotional skills, improved sleep, and stress. 
Through the help of technology, they grew networks of peer support, and that helped them become more engaged in learning. So what does all that mean? Kids need connection to learn, and technology is a powerful tool for connection. When we embrace it as a tool, we can use it to help support child development, both on the planet and maybe someday another one. Thanks, Dr. Lowe. So what does this all mean for children's lives in future space cities? Well, there are a lot of challenges in space. As we learned in our episode on space and mental health, space is isolating. Physical, emotional, and mental health care is limited. You have much less control over your day-to-day life. Little to no personal space, constant noise, and very little novelty. And when you get fed up, you can't really go anywhere. Ask anyone on the ISS, every vacation is a staycation. And these challenges are compounded for children, for whom novelty, play, and social connection are crucial to their growth and development. As Dr. Lowe said, learning is a social process, a lot like what we're doing here on Space for Humans right now. So let's think back to future celebrity child astronaut Cassiopeia. Her mission may be a long way off, but thinking about how to support her in space highlights the key considerations we have to take into account when designing technologies for children here on Earth. Because here's the thing. In space, technology is pretty great. In fact, almost all human needs in space are met by technology. And not just physical needs, but social and emotional needs too. Think about Cassiopeia calling home to talk with friends and family. That's only possible thanks to technological advancement. In space, technology would keep kids connected. But that's important on Earth too. Thanks for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe for more Space for Humans. First, we'll take a space place race case. Then we'll have a space race craze case. Crazy races, spacey places. Thank you for joining Space for Humans. <laughs> I think that's good. No. Are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? No. Look, sir. Look, sir. Dr. Space, sir. Let us talk of Earth and space, sir. Let us face mistakes of space, sir.